In our pursuit of Chapter 7, Section 1, we start with California State Standard Number 8. We're doing just the portion that's in red, and that's solving quadratic equations by completing the square process. And this means that we're solving quadratic equations whose answers are complex numbers. So let's start out with a couple of easy equations that we have here, where all we really need to do is take the square root of both sides. And as we take the square root of the left side, don't forget the square root of an, an, error, an algebraic expression quantity squared is going to be the absolute value of that radicand. So the square root of x minus 3 quantity squared is the absolute value of x minus 3, and that equals the square root of 7. Don't forget from earlier in this curriculum that in the absolute value equation is an or sentence. We've got the positive 0 case to solve. We have the negative case to solve. If it's positive or zero, we don't need the absolute value signs. If we think it's negative, the way to make it positive is to take the opposite of what was in the absolute value signs. So let's solve the equation on the left by adding 3 to both sides. And we get x is 3 plus the square root of 7. On the right side, what we're going to do is we're going to distribute out that negative sign, or the opposite symbol. So we have the opposite of x plus 3 is the square root of 7. Subtract 3 from both sides. We have the opposite of x is the negative 3 plus the square root of 7. And if we multiply everything in that equation by negative 1, we get x equals 3 minus the square root of 7. So our two answers are x equals 3 plus the square root of 7 or x equals 3 minus the square root of 7, which we can write using this notation that x is equal to 3 plus or minus the square root of 7. Now again, the fundamental theorem of algebra that our book does not address to much later, we do know that if we have x squared, we're looking for two answers. And we know that from future theorems, if you have an irrational root, you will also have its conjugate. So that's why we have 3 plus the square root of 7 and 3 minus the square root of 7. That's coming to us at, uh, as a theorem much later in the year. And let's move on to our next example. So in example 1b, we have 2x minus 3 quantity squared equals 7. So we'll take the square root of both sides. That gives us the absolute value of 2x minus 3 equals the square root of 7. And to do the shortcut here, only when it's the absolute value equal can we drop off the absolute value signs and put a plus or minus in front of the quantity on the other side of the equal sign, in this case, the square root of 7. If we add 3 to both sides, divide everything by 2, then we will get our two solutions. x is 3 plus the square root of 7 over 2, and x is 3 minus the square root of 7 over 2. And we have, again, two irrational roots who are conjugates of each other. All right, let's continue on with example 1c. We're going to start out by taking the square root of both sides. And that gives us the absolute value of x plus 5. And remember, the square root of negative 4 does not exist in the real number system. So we factor out the square root of negative 1, which we replace with i in the imaginary number system. And the square root of 4 is 2. Dropping off the absolute value signs, we'll say that's plus or minus 2i. And if we subtract 5 from both sides, we'll find out that our two solutions are x equals negative 5 plus 2i, and x equals negative 5 minus 2i. Those are the two solutions to our equation. There's a theorem coming later in the year that if you get a complex root, you will also have its conjugate. So we see a preview of that now. Now, what we're doing is actually we will not always see equations set up so nice and simple for us. So what we have been practicing is been a setup to help us prepare for a process known as completing the square, which is our task for today. And everything that we had previous to example two, the left side of the equal sign was a perfect square trinomial that somebody already factored. If we look at this, it is not a perfect square trinomial. And so what we want to do is to force it to be a perfect square trinomial. Now, why are we doing this? Well, as we look at this equation, we can't solve it by factoring. So we need to look for other methods to use to solve these quadratic equations. Again, we're looking for two solutions. It will not factor. 
So let's start this process of taking the constant, moving it to the other side, so it's the only thing on the other side of the equation. And I've got x squared minus 6x equals 3. Now just for a moment, think back to chapter 4, and think of all the work we did with perfect square trinomials. First step would be it would have to be a trinomial, which I don't have on the left side of the equal sign, but I can certainly add something to the left side of the equal sign as long as I add it to the right side. So the question might be, what would I want to add here to make it a perfect square trinomial? And before we answer that, it must be addition because a perfect square trinomial formula has to be a trinomial. Last one has to be positive. So it needs to be an addition, a plus. First one has to be a perfect square. Last one has to be a perfect square. That has to be a perfect square. So the numbers could be any number that's a perfect square. And some of you may be seeing that in your mind's eye already. You think, oh, okay, if that's 9, that'll make the left side a perfect square trinomial. And some of you are wondering, well, where did we get the 9 from? So I'll tell you, because the next example will go through the process. The way you find this number is to take the coefficient of x to the first term and do two things to it. First thing is you divide it by 2, so 6 divided by 2 is 3. And the second thing you do is square it. 3 squared is 9. That's how you find this number. Now, you couldn't just add 9 to the left side of the equation unless you also added it to the right side of the equation, which we did. Now, the left side of the equation is a perfect square trinomial from chapter 4. So, we factor that as the square root of the first one, the square root of the last one, the sine of the middle one. Just to double check, we multiply those two, negative 3x, and double it. We get the middle term. Yes, it did factor as a perfect square trinomial. Now, on the right side of the equal sign, 3 plus 9 is 12. Now here is what the example 1a, 1b, and 1c looked like. And so we are creating this ourselves. So now we're in familiar territory. Take the square root of both sides. That gives us the absolute value of x minus 3 is the square root of 12 can be factored as the square root of 4, or 2, times the square root of 3. We can drop off the absolute value signs in an equal if we put plus or minus in front of it, and that takes care of our two cases. Let's add 3 to both sides, and we get our two solutions, x equals 3 plus 2 square roots of 3, and x equals 3 minus 2 square roots of 3. If we have an irrational answer, we will also have its conjugate. Those are the two solutions to my equation. All right, so let's get into a little bit more detail about this process. This process is called completing the square. And what we want to do is we want to be able to do this whether the coefficient of x squared is 1, which we just did in the previous example, or whether it's not 1, which we're going to see in the next example. And here's what we do for the process. What we did to summarize is we took that constant c and we moved it to the right side of the equation to get it by itself. Now, in the last example, a was 1, so we didn't have to do anything there. So we did the third step, is we added the both sides of equation, that coefficient of x divided by 2 quantity squared. And then we factored the left side of the equation as a perfect square trinomial, took the square root of both sides to solve. So let's look at the completing the square in the next example. We want to take the constant, move it to the other side. That's our first step. We do that by subtracting 5. Now step 2 says if the coefficient of the squared term isn't 1. Well, it's not. So we need to divide everything in sight by that number. Doing so gives me y squared plus y equals negative 5 halves. And from there, what we want to do is to find out what number we could add to the left side of the equation that would make what was on the left side a perfect square trinomial. So yes, adding one more term would make it a trinomial. has to be addition, because the last term has to be positive. It must be a perfect square. But to find it, we take the coefficient of the x or y to the first power and do two things to it, divide it by 2 and square it. The coefficient is invisible there because it's a 1. We're going to take that 1 divided by 2, which is a half, and square it. So 1 half squared is 1 fourth. 
So off to the side here, what we have is something I call the Texas two-step. Now, it's just unique to me. That's just my little name to help you remember the process. Texas two-step is a dance, and there's only two steps in it, and that's why it's called a two-step. Over here, we did two things, two steps, and both of them involve the number two. We took this coefficient divided by two, and then we squared it. So we did two steps, both involving the number two, divide by two, raised to the second power. So whatever that number is, that coefficient of the linear term, that y to the first or x to the first, take that coefficient, whatever it is, divided by two, square it. That's what you need to add to both sides of the equation. On the left side of the equation, that gives us a perfect square trinomial. Now, we're not sure because we haven't done perfect square trinomials with fractions before, but let's just double check. It's a trinomial. Last one's positive. First one's a perfect square. That's correct. That's why. Last one's a perfect square. Yep, its square root is 1 half. If I multiply those together, I get 1 half y. And if I double it, I get the middle term, because doubling a half is 1, I get 1y. So yep, it's a perfect square trinomial. That's going to factor as the square root of the first one, square root of the last one, sine of the middle one, quantity squared. Now in my mind, I just said that uh, negative 5 halves is the same as negative 10 fourths. And negative 10 fourths plus 1 fourth is negative 9 fourths. Let's square root both sides. The square root on the left is going to give me of that y plus 1 half quantity squared will give me the absolute value of y plus 1 half. On the right, the square root of negative 1 is i. The square root of 9 is 3. And the denominator, the square root of 4 is 2. And we can drop off the absolute value signs in if its absolute value equals by putting a plus or minus in front of that number, 3i over 2. And that'll take care of both the positive 0 case and the negative case. Well, the last thing to do here is to subtract 1 half from both sides. And if we do that, we get y is equal to negative 1 half plus or minus 3 halves i. Now, the book may have written this as negative 1 plus or minus 3i all over 2. But this is probably preferred because then our answer looks more like a complex number. We have the real portion. We have the imaginary portion. And again, if we have a complex solution, we probably have its conjugate. So what we have here is negative 1 half plus 3 halves i and negative 1 half minus 3 halves i. And those are the two solutions to my original equation. And what we learned to solve this with today is a process called completing the square.